Okay, so now that we've seen what a vector space is, which I'll remind you is just a set, which I'll keep calling V, on which we have a notion of vector addition and scalar multiplication taken together, the elements along with the operations and the rules that they must follow form a vector space. And I'll just remind you this is a vector space over the field of real numbers. So up until this point, I've been calling the elements of this space, the vectors, just abstract letters. I've been using lowercase v to denote a vector in the space v. So this doesn't tell us anything more about the structure that this vector object has, just that it's part of the vector space v. So now I want to introduce a new concept, that of a basis. So a basis is another set, which I'm going to call B, which is a subset of our vector space. So the elements of this set B I'm going to call E. E is a member of the basis. And to, because we're going to have, or could potentially have, more, multiple numbers of these E's, I'm going to keep track of them using the index I. So this subscript index I is just some number that could one run from 1 to any number up to, say, d, where d is a number which we call the dimension of the vector space, which is usually written dim. OK, so what's the point of doing this? Well, these basis vectors, they are vectors as they live in the space v, these basis vectors are special in that they so-called span the vector space. What this means is, is that any vector in V can be expressed as a so-called linear combination, a linear combination of these basis vectors. So what does this mean and how do we construct this? Well, a linear combination is simply a sum, a slightly special kind of sum, which I'll talk about in a second, but for now it's just a sum over something which I'm going to call lowercase v superscript i, these objects, these vi's, are going to be drawn from our field, so they're going to be scalars. And then since it's a scalar, all we can do is scalar multiply something, a vector, and we scalar multiply these v components with some particular basis vector. And this whole thing is equal to the vector. So this is what it means when we say that these basis vectors span the space. We can expand any vector in the space as a linear combination of these basis vectors. And I mentioned that this is a, a special kind of sum. It's special in the fact that it's not summing numbers, it's summing vectors. So if we expand out the sum, I could write it like this. I could say that V is equal to, this is the vector that we're expanding, its first component times the first basis vector, or sorry, scalar multiplied the first basis vector. This whole thing is just another vector in the space, since we know that scalar multiplication just produces a third vector in the space. So since it's a vector in the space, I can add it to, vector add it to, any other vector in the space, which will be v2, say, and so on, all the way up to the ith basis vector. So we're going to have d terms in this sum, where d is the dimension of the space. So a vector can be effectively decomposed into what we call its components with respect to some particular basis vector. So I mentioned that any vector in the space can be expanded in this way. There is a slight caveat to this in that the basis vectors themselves cannot be expressed as a linear combination of the other basis vectors. Effectively, what this is saying is that the, the EIs, they are so-called linearly independent. And this is one of the requirements that any subset that you find be, it must satisfy in order to be a basis. All of its basis elements must be linearly independent.
So just to quickly recap then, you find in your vector space a particular subset of vectors which are linearly independent. The number that you the, the number of linearly independent vectors that you require to span the space is equal to the dimension. And to span the space means that every vector in the space can be expressed as this linear combination of the basis vectors. So now a key point is that this basis that we've found doesn't have to be unique. We could have other bases, say B prime, which is a subset of V with the elements epsilon i, say. Then, just as equally, we could express v in terms of this new basis, this epsilon basis. So I'll call its components new. So we're talking about the same vector. We're just expressing it in terms of a new basis, this epsilon basis. And through the eyes of this basis, it will have some other set of components, new i but it's the same vector as before, so it's got to be equal to the original expression we had in the E basis. So now you'll see that I've been using this sum symbol to denote our linear combination. I'm now going to switch to using the so-called Einstein summation convention, which states that whenever you see something like VI, EI, with one index up and one index down, there is an implied summation. And I'll often just drop this scalar multiplication symbol as well, as you should understand from the context what is the basis and what is the component. So using this, we'll be able to come up with relations of how the bases and the particular components relate to each other and we'll have transformation formulas that relate to how the vector is expressed in the different bases, or rather how the vector components um, relate to each other in the different bases. So commonly, it's, it's usual to um, refer to the, the vector just in terms of its components. We don't talk about the vector abstractly, we talk about it concrete, concretely by just giving you the list of components. Usually the basis is clear or implied. So when somebody talks about a vector, they'll just hand you a list of components. Each component is implicitly tied to one of the basis vectors, say. So now a final point to make. When I wrote down this basis originally, I chose to use a subscript i to index the basis. I could have just as equally written down e superscript i to be my basis with the i index. This is simply just a notational choice at this point. It was completely arbitrary which choice I made. However, when we introduce later on things called the, something called the dual basis, we're going to have to use an upstairs index for the dual basis because we made the choice to use a, a, a subscript for the regular basis. This is purely a choice. We just need to be careful once we've made the choice to adhere to it. There's no meaning to the index placement, whether it's up or down, other than the fact that we made the choice here to start with it being down when we define the basis. And then when we go to define the dual basis, we're going to need to distinguish it from the regular basis, which is why the two types of basis have upstairs and downstairs indices.